Rusty stood looking downward through a diagonally angled viewing window of the alien spaceship Nogala. Rusty was the logistics specialist, one of humans in a crew of nearly 2,000. The majority of the crew, including the captain, were Denari, with aliens from several other races making up the balance of the crew. He watched the orbital bombing of a human warship on the Unla homeworld. The conflict between the Unla and the Denari was until now quite mundane. They bordered each other, so they had the usual border disputes over territory with contested planets, shifting ownership every few years. A lone ship with light armament from either side would drop a couple bombs and annex the area. There was no resistance from the inhabitants. Several of the planets, for the sake of efficiency, had actually set up target zones in uninhabited areas, so that whoever wanted to declare themselves the owner of the region could drop ordnance at that site, rather than destroy any property or kill any inhabitants. It had all become very boring and civilized over the last few centuries, until someone decided to get humans involved. Rusty stood, watching the assault through the window, grim-faced, with some ugly memories from his time in the Terra Marines playing through his head. That's why he seemed not to notice when Captain Voon came ambling towards him. Voon was Denari, a huge crab-insect-looking creature that typically towered over Rusty. However, the way Voon on came creeping along with an almost subdued posture would make you think that he was intimidated by Rusty. Voon gazed through the window for a moment, then chittered, I have never seen such devastation. Oxidize, is this truly how your species normally conducts warfare? The corner of Rusty's mouth twitched. Rusty, Voon, Rusty, when are you ever going to get my name fixed in your translators? Voon's head seemed to dip. Apologies, Rusty. I will attempt again to have the issue corrected. Rusty's eyebrows lifted. Denari were extremely hierarchical, and therefore higher-ranking individuals never apologized to lower-ranking individuals under any circumstances. The abrupt way that higher-ranking individuals would speak to lower-ranking individuals was infuriating to most humans. However, Rusty had been raised by his grandfather, an old combat veteran with chronic pain, who believed that actions spoke louder than words. The Denari lack of trivial niceties didn't bother Rusty, especially not after his years in the Terra Marines. However, the fact that Voon had apologized to Rusty, especially for such a trivial matter, was significant. Rusty turned toward Voon and decided that an attitude of kind condescension, like when speaking to a child, would probably be most appropriate. Tell me what's on your mind, Voon. Voon shifted a lower appendage slightly and pointed down through the window. Normally, I would not experience any distress over suffering of Unla, but this level of devastation just seems excessive. I never would have believed such a thing possible, especially when the conflict between our species has been mundane for so long. Rusty sighed. Voon, do you remember when I warned you not to get my people involved? This is why. You know how that other human that ran the shuttle service at Space Station 6 told you the exact same thing? Voon clicked and replied, I remember. You and he intensely disliked each other. The animosity seemed even stronger than when competing for a mate, yet you had complete consensus. Rusty nodded. That should tell you something. We have practiced every type of warfare and military philosophy imaginable even before we begin to record our history. One of those philosophies is that when you get involved in someone else's conflict, the best strategy is to wait for the two sides to wear each other down, then go in with fresh troops and completely decimate both sides. At that point, you set up a puppet government made of local politicians, so it gives the natives the illusion that they are still in control of their area. We let you keep your ruler, traditions, and religion, but we also send in an advisor, who is the actual ruler of the area, and institute our own language for all official correspondence and functions. We collect heavy taxes and station permanent garrisons, calling them peacekeepers who protect our new ally. Their actual function is to ensure the taxes are collected and to eliminate any potential sign of insurgency as soon as it is detected. The empires that my people established that followed that protocol lasted over a thousand years. This is who my people are. Voon wiggled a couple upper appendages. I had heard some stories, but they seemed rather far-fetched. All of your people that everyone has encountered has been entertainers, artists, laborers, and service personnel. While you do have a military, 
They are not a codified caste within your society, and they also represent less than 2% of your population. If I was not witnessing this with my own eyes, I never would have believed that this was possible. Rusty thought a moment. My grandpa told me a story that might explain this. Voon shifted his body, settling to a resting position, so that he could fully concentrate on the story. Fables, legends, traditional myths, and other such stories were highly prized in galactic society because they could give you far more insight into an alien culture than months of lectures in a classroom. Please proceed, you have my full attention. Rusty's look turned inward, reliving childhood memories. I used to get into fights when I was a kid, which is fairly common for young boys. I was trying to stop, but it was difficult. So my grandfather told me this story. There are two wolves living inside of us. There is a wolf who is violent, and then another wolf who is kind. They constantly fight for control. I asked my grandfather which wolf is the strongest. He told me the one that you feed. If you act violently, then that feeds the violent wolf so that your nature will become violent. However, if you act with kindness, you will feed that one so that it will be stronger and you will be kind. However, the other wolf is still there, weaker, but not dead. Humans always have that violent wolf trying to gain control. Voan contemplated the story, then finally spoke. Is that who you are? Rusty looked at Voan steadily without blinking. Yes, I have been violent in my life, and not just when I served in the Terra Marines. I constantly feed the kind wolf so that the violent wolf does not take over. Voan contemplated for a few moments more, then finally spoke. We just received word that a human fleet has surrounded Denar demanding surrender, and that most other Denari colonies are being occupied now. The Council is still trying to reach consensus on how to deal with the situation. However, I have decided how to proceed in regards to my ship. Voan straightened up from his resting posture. Rusty eyes grew wide, then narrowed, his heart suddenly accelerated, his fists clenched, and his entire body tensed. He had made several jokes about Voan possibly eating him, but with this news and Voan towering over him, those jokes didn't seem so funny now. Voan instantly detected the shift in Rusty. His combat pheromones had suddenly become overwhelming as the aggression hormones surged. Something that made humans so terrifying was their ability to instantly produce large amounts of aggression hormones at will. These hormones were at least as strong as restricted combat enhancement drugs to the point where humans could exceed their normal physical limits. They could also ignore pain and deadly wounds, instantly purge debilitating intoxicants, and even be fully consumed by psychotic rage. This made sense considering that the human home planet Earth was at least a Class 11 death world. What's more, humans produced more than one type of these hormones, so to neutralize a human in combat, you would have to atomize them. This is why humans were actually banned from several regions of space. Voon had planned on a formal ritual to handle the situation, but seeing and smelling Rusty in this state was terrifying. He crashed down to the floor, withdrew his appendages, and spoke slowly and quickly. As captain of the Denari ship Nogala, I hereby surrender the ship and crew to you as a representative of Earth. Neither I nor any member of the crew will take any hostile action against any human or Earth ship or organization. We ask you to accept our surrender immediately without conditions. Rusty blinked several times, feeling almost lightheaded as his brain processed what he just heard and the adrenaline drained from his system. Finally, he nodded. As a representative of Earth, I accept your surrender and place you under my protection. I have a couple Earth flags in my cabin. I'll give them to the maintenance crew so the ship can be marked appropriately. Voon gave a series of small clicks, almost like the Denari version of giggling. He would be awarded status by his government once they reached consensus because he had managed to save the ship and crew without violence or property damage. Rusty couldn't believe his luck. He was now a glorified stockroom clerk and yet somehow had secured the surrender of a 2,000 crew alien vessel without lifting a finger. He was going to get free drinks for life with a story like that. The universe was a really weird place.